2018 was the most personal because it was, you know, I went from so high of a mountain, you know, fifth in the world, worldwide, in the open, but forfeiting that season to be on a team, which I, I, I would never take that back, but to come back the next year, you know, with the excitement and the, the thrill of this idea that, wow, maybe I'm as competitive as Fraser and Belner and all of this stuff. Um, and then to not even get out the first path, yeah. it was like, I mean, it's like getting shot in the heart. Like What's up, everyone? You're listening to the Do Hard Things podcast by Elite SRS. The purpose of this show is to share stories of hardship and victory as an encouragement for those in the middle of their own hard thing. Because we know hardship produces perseverance, which produces character, which ultimately produces hope. Today's guest is Anthony Davis. Anthony is a CrossFit athlete and coach and currently holds the CrossFit record for the heaviest snatch at 340 pounds. Anthony talks about failing to make it out of regionals in 2018 and how that failure transformed his perspective from entitled to grateful. I hope you enjoy the show and please don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes. But now, here's the conversation with Anthony Davis. Yeah, so um, Anthony Davis, uh, I live in St. Paul, Minnesota right now with my wife. Um, I'm a manager of a gym. I program for a gym. I have my own programming. Um, and then I also train competitively in the sport of CrossFit. Um, I've been doing CrossFit competitively for about seven years. Two years of that, I took off to compete in weightlifting. Um, specifically, now I'm back in CrossFit. And so that's kind of what I do. Um, I recently took on a role with Faith RX as just helping out at a camp, which has turned into a lot more pieces and being a part of some of their future visions and the stuff that they're trying to push out as well. And so I'm excited for kind of more of what this year has in store because it's been like I kind of mentioned um, it's been like a long last year and now this year is kind of like the seeds are starting to grow and I don't really know what that harvest looks like quite yet um, but we're starting to see the fruit bloom a little bit and so it's just really exciting time for me um, yeah. and yeah and so managing training uh, CrossFit as well right now so <laughs> open is happening and other stuff so yeah yeah how what's been your uh opinion of the open workouts um so i obviously i'm a bigger athlete if you guys don't know <laughs> who i am i'm 220 pounds um i also am kind of known for lifting very very heavy so i have biases towards heavier <laughs> lifts and stuff like that um but i personally you know I, i've been coaching for over eight years um done the been a part of the open for nine years and so it's like the open is supposed to be a community event and i think this year did a really good job at focusing more on that um all of my biases and positions aside like at the end of the day that doesn't really matter um yeah. the open is i think more inclusive i think it i think it was fine i think the workouts might have been a little too similar just kind of knowing some of the other stuff I heard recently, there are supposed to be some slight changes. So I'm just curious about things like that. Um, but I'm interested to see how the programs continue to progress. Um, because I, I, that takes a lot of thought into the training stuff as well. Like we're always trying to get better, but for someone like me, who's a little bit more specific, like I have to work extra hard for some of those weaknesses, just being a bigger athlete, you know, if the programming isn't catered or offering people my size, really any advantage, then who knows what team might look like or things like that, that might make a little bit more sense. So, right. Right. So not enough heavy lifting. 
to summarize the initial. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I would like a little bit heavier, um, or even like this last workout. Oh yeah, 135 pound thrusters, no joke for sure. But it's you only you got to earn it through a bunch of gymnastics too. You know, so it's right. like, yeah, yes and no. And for the level I'm trying to compete at, I don't think it's going to stump too many people. So. Sure. We'll see. Quarterfinals will be fun, and it is about having fun. And I, I have enjoyed the process this year. So, right. So, talk about because uh, did you? So, did you meet your wife during COVID, or did you guys already know each other and then get married during COVID? I'm curious. You like, met. What that story is like. Oh, uh, so. So the whole story. I'll do it kind of quick. So okay. I was I was driving to Salt Lake City to compete in the um, American Open Finals for weightlifting in 2019, in December. So I had made a poll or something when I was hanging out in Denver because it was my 26th birthday, 25th. I don't even know. I forget how old I am. So I made like a poll, like 25 facts about me or something silly like that. Um, And she had happened to just, we had just become friends because she had joined the gym that I live at or I'm working at now, which I was on a team with in 2017. Okay. Um, and so we had become friends through just mutual connections because I thought she looked nice and it was cool. So yeah, so reached works. out. Um, we had never talked, but she had asked a question on one of our uh one of my polls, and then I we just started talking from there. Um, and then two months later we met for the first time in Chicago. And then we got engaged in June and then we got married in November. <laughs> so just went for it, man. You were, you're convinced. It's one of those, you, you know, like everyone says it, if you know, you know, and I always thought that that was kind of like, all right, but you really do. Like it, it's, it was a whole different experience when you, when you just know, and you're like, yeah, this person's all in for me. And I know that, and I knew more so for myself because everything in my life was changing. Yeah. Like I was like, wow, I need to get a grip on this part of my life, this part of my life. Like I don't, I don't even want to potentially ruin this thing. Um, and so when I, when I noticed that trend in myself, it was like pretty <laughs> evident. And so it was just like, and I saw the fruit of that, right? Like things that I had, not been super smart about before. And next thing you know, I'm like, oh, I got enough money for a ring and I got enough money for this. And just like stewarding things actually the right way. And you're like, all right, this is definitely the person. Cause I wouldn't, ne- I've never done this before. <laughs> you're like, I'm a better version of myself than I was before I met her. This is probably a good thing. Yeah. It may be a little painful oh, yeah. sometimes, it's, but it's worth it. Oh yeah. It's been the best blessing ever. That's awesome. Well, congrats. It's relatively new. It sounds like maybe, what are you guys like a year and a half in and then? Yeah, just about. Okay. So, yeah. Just right, getting started, right man. It. Journey of a lifetime. I know. Right. So that's fun. Yeah. We like, my wife and I, we're only, what are we? We're almost six years in. And yeah. uh, we like to think of it as like, we're a six year old. Like, so we give ourselves lots of grace, you know, like, okay, we, we're only six. Like, what does a six-year-old know in the scheme of life? Like, okay, we got we got lots of years to mature and figure it out as a married couple, you know. Yeah. So. That's actually that's a super smart way to look at it. it that's it actually really cool. I, yeah. I like that idea a ton, actually. Uh and it, it helped us out too, like being in COVID the year that we met. Like I mean, she works in a hospital, but gyms were shut down so i was like i got nothing else but time right. right like we we could just invest a lot of time into each other i could coach zooms from the garage here in minnesota so i'd drive out here like every other week stay for two weeks or so and then go back because i didn't yeah. have to be anywhere so we got a lot of real intentional time to like grow and then and then the fact of the world and kind of chaos you know we we got to engage that uh right. together so it in weird way it almost probably set us up it's been a harder transition now with me working a lot more 
and then her working a lot more. And like, how do we embrace this dynamic yeah. where we're both busy? Cause we've had so much time for each other prior. So. Right. Yeah. That is a but, big change. So like, I remember when my wife and I, when we moved, cause we moved in the middle of COVID. And so then we were in this new town, everything shut down. We had all the time in the world. And we were like, what? like it's kind of nice. You know, we've got all the, every night is free. We can just hang out. And now I look at our life and I'm like, what happened? We have no time anymore. And it was, you know, there's like good and bad on both sides, but you like have to be really intentional with your time now because otherwise it just, it all gets taken. So. Right. Oh, true that man, for sure. Dude, okay. So your life is, it sounds like at this point anyways, it's pretty centered around CrossFit and whether it's coaching or training or even faith RX. Um, what, what about CrossFit? Uh, this is, I mean, this podcast is about doing hard things. What about CrossFit makes it a hard thing? Cause everybody I think would say that's true. Um, but what about it makes it true? Yeah. I mean, there's so many answers that, and this is why I said, like when I was reading this, I'm like, man, this guy's coming right after me is doing CrossFit is probably one of the hardest things for me. Um, prior to like my whole faith journey is really to prove a lot of people wrong. For me, it was kind of a redemption of coaches and people that talked negatively about me, um, not going on to play football in college. Um, so there's a lot of parts for me where CrossFit was like, I'm, I'm going to prove to everyone that I'm not weak or I'm capable or this or that. And now flip that coming into faith and then really coming into faith around 2018. Now the hardest part is like, how do I really live? How do I attack something, but also be fully in for Christ at the same time? Like, how do I selfishly do a sport and also be wholesomely a servant to others? Um, and I think a lot of people wrestle with that more than, maybe they share. Cause I think a lot of times CrossFit, I mean, most of us, right. I don't know how many of us have million dollar deals or million dollar sponsorships. <laughs> yeah. Right. I don't, I've never been paid to make a post on Instagram, you know, like things like that. And it's like, so I train five hours a day for what, <laughs> you know, like to, to like, what is the goal? Right. Um, yeah. And I think over time, a lot of us run into that wall where it's like, why, why am I really doing this? Um, and it, it always turns out to be much deeper. Like either we've built it up to be something to prove ourselves or it's maybe it's an idol or a fear or a thing like that. And so I think the hard part with CrossFit is that it, it really challenges you personally in a much deeper way than just the sport because you have to embrace things that you don't know, things that you don't understand. You have to be vulnerable because you have people watching all of the time. Yeah. Um, they're watching your character. They're watching how you react. They're seeing, are you, how are you strong? And there's a leaderboard that says, right. are you faster than this person or not this person, right? It, it challenges every facet of our human nature. Um, and in a way, I, I find that helpful right because we need to be able to step into those things um but it also is really hard because at some point i think you're going to be faced with the reality of like why do i do crossfit yeah and what is actually behind that yeah so i heard two things it sounded like there's like that purpose and the why you know it, it forces you to think about because it's an investment of your time and your energy and it's a community oh, thing, sure. right? So you've got to you've got to understand your why or your purpose. But then the second one was it's like this balance between, and I think this is probably true in most uh, sports and probably in career. But like the fate between faith and success, and like how do those two right. coexist, right? How do I give my full energy, effort, heart, mind, soul into what I'm doing, whether it's being a CrossFit athlete or coach or a businessman, like and, and bring my faith into that same space because the world will tell us you can't do both. Right. They, right. That, uh, 
you've got to set aside other people and be about you in order to climb the ladder and, and find results. And, uh, so, um, talk about that balance, like, cause you got, you hinted at it at the beginning of your answer, like faith and success. How do I do both? How do I serve people well and serve the desires that I have to be successful? Yeah. Um, I've actually, I had a conversation literally about this yesterday with a good buddy of mine. Um, in terms of like how it's been revealed to me, I had to recognize like, all right, I have a specific gift, right? Like, I don't know why I'm good at CrossFit. There's a lot of people who do CrossFit. There's a lot of people who train as hard as I do. Um, but why do I find success time and time and time again? You know, like, and then also, why do people find that fascinating or exciting, sure. right? Like, I, I go to the gym just like everyone else, but people are more excited to watch me do the workout then maybe even for themselves, right? And so what I kind of recognized it as in terms of doing both is like, well, really in anything, it's an integrity piece, right? Like if I want to be an influence and an ambassador, right? Like people are going to gravitate towards someone who is all in on their gifts, right? And they accept that that gift is theirs and they run with it, right? Like that's what we all want. No one wants to have just this basic flat life. They want to be like, wow, this is the part, this is the thing that sets me apart right. and they go after it. And so for me going into the gym and it's a daily reminder, cause it's still very hard for me is that like, I am going to be the best steward to my community by doing my absolute best in the gym, because that's where they see me excel they know that I'm gifted at it and they know that I'm working hard, that I give it my best effort and they want to see me succeed because they know that that's a part of me. Yeah. In the wrestling match, I was talking to my buddy, Jody, who's uh, one of the board members at Faith RX. And he described it as kind of the, the balance between like, how is Jesus fully God and fully man? <laughs> right. It's a, it's a, it's the similar, like what it's that mystery, right? Like I'm asking the question, how can I be both all in for you, but then also a complete servant, right? I want to, I'm not Jesus, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I have to, I have to ask myself like, what is serving others? Well, right. Cause he knows if I win the CrossFit games, I really don't care. Right. Like I don't, but he's like, if you win the CrossFit games, I know you're going to bring all of that glory to God. Cause that's what you do. Um, and I was listening to a message yesterday by Matt Chandler and he was talking about like, if um, he was like, if you're really good at business, like keep grinding because the people who make a lot of money, if their hearts for God, I know that they're going to steward that for the kingdom. Yeah. They're not just going to hoard it. Right. And so I was like, yeah, that's, I have to remind myself that all the time that like, it shouldn't be guilty to have things that you're gifted at, and then pursue them with all of your heart, because that will probably steward more down the road than if I just kind of float across life, hoping that maybe it, somebody sees something good out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, was that a, like a weekend retreat type deal summit for um, folks in the sports industry that were on the business side. And it was called the Daniel summit. And the whole reason it's called mm -hmm. the Daniel summit is uh, Daniel had influence because he was excellent. And uh, right. so they talk about the whole, like the whole conversation all weekend was how do you do what you were called to do with excellence so that you can have the influence. And uh, I, it, I, that stuck with me because there's that tension, right. Of like, I'm supposed to be like serving and giving and, and pursuing, you know, all these people. And, but then how do you still be excellent at what your, you know, your right. given career is when you give so much of your time away and you can do that even more. So at, like, is kind of the idea when you are excellent at what you do, obviously with the intention right. of your heart to like glorify the Lord in it. But, uh, so for sure. Um, so you weren't always a CrossFit athlete. You said nine years ago was your first open. 
how did you get started with it? And then why have you just stuck with it? Um, so I found it because I didn't go on to play college football. Um, I was supposed to go to a school, like a small school, and I kind of had a plan to do the small school thing and then try to get into a bigger one. Um, but I didn't end up getting into the school, um, just academic reasons. Sure. Um, not even bad. It's just a highly academic school. So I was, just, I was <laughs> like, I had a three, I had a three, three, I had a 23 ACT, very average school guy. Uh, but I didn't get in. And so then I was wrestling with the fact of like, oh man, what do I do now? So my dad and uncle were D1 football players. Um, and so that was kind of like a subliminal pressure on, on yeah. me kind of my whole life. What position um, were you playing? I was a strong safety and a fullback. Okay. And then I, I moved to defensive end my senior year of high school. Um, but were you yeah, always and so were you always 220? I was 220 in high school. I was. Dude, that's a but big, I'm only five. That's a big I'm only five point. nine. Yeah. Our strong safety was more like a, a flex. We were more like an outside linebacker type. Okay. So he played mostly cover three over top. So I covered most shallow things, but I was more of an edge contained player versus um, that. So it was fun. I liked it. My dad was a corner. So I've always, I've always had a big heart for defense. Um, but yeah, so I wrestled identity wise, like what is something that I'm going to do now? Cause I'm not playing football and it's not likely somehow I'm magically going to end up on a field again. Um, so I saw CrossFit on TV over the summer before college. It was just kind of like planted in my head. I was like, oh, that's pretty sweet. This looks kind of fun. Um, and then I had some buddies who had started a strength club at my alma mater. And I noticed them because they were carrying like PVCs and foam rollers around wearing rogue shorts. So you just knew, I was like, oh, that's the CrossFit people. Um, and so I think I was doing like tricep pushdowns and they asked if they could use the pull-up bar to do muscle ups and so in between them doing that and me doing triceps I was like hey where do you guys do crossfit and where do you do and so I joined them they were coaching at a gym that I coached at for about five years and then we uh yeah that's just kind of how I got into it yeah. um and then what was the second part of that question why did you stick with it for so long Oh man. Uh, I stuck with it cause I had pretty good success. I mean, when I, I was a freshman in college when I started. Um, and so I was going, I did the open in three months, which didn't turn out super well. Um, just cause I couldn't do half the stuff. Uh, <laughs> then a year, then a year later, um, I had a decent score. I think I finished around 133rd in the region or something like that yeah 2015 and so then I was like okay well they are shifting the open now so now it's going to be the top 20 so I was like all right well I'm 20 years old right now by next year if I'm top 100 and then if I get into the top 70 then I'll commit three years to try to make a regional yeah. The next year I made it. I was 19th in the central. So I went from like 1600th in my region to 133rd to 19th. A very, very fast progression. Um, went to regionals. It was a good time. And then I got recruited to move to Minnesota to be on a team in 2017. Um, and so that was actually. Yeah, I moved to Minnesota, went to the games on a team. That year I had finished fifth worldwide in the Open. Um, so I, I get, I, now I'm like, wow, my whole plan, everything is going. And this is great. Um, 2018, I had one event that was so bad that I missed regionals by one place. Um, and then whatever felt like my life was doing awesome felt <laughs> the complete yeah. opposite just about every every pillar of the house that i had built 
Uh, so when you when you hear him talk about build it on the solid foundation, I was definitely in the sand because it everything mm-hmm. got washed out. Um, so much as that, I just kind of went off the rails a little bit, trained extra extra hard, but just trying to not feel like I did. Um, and then I went to Granite Games that year was on the podium going into the last event. And then the same thing that kept me out of regionals took me off of that podium. So I actually quit CrossFit for two years because of that. I was like, I'm just going to do a weightlifting event. I qualified for nationals at my first weightlifting event. And I was like, I'm just going to stick with weightlifting. This is easier mentally, physically for me. I'm probably naturally better at it. Um, Then I met my wife came back to Minnesota, she could tell that something was missing. Um, And I think more so she could tell that i maybe missed that challenge of CrossFit, like we kind of talked about earlier. Um, And she was like, you know, we have the time and the resources now. Like, have you ever thought about going back to CrossFit? I was like, I haven't really put any thought into it, but I'll ask my old coach and see if he wants to help me out. And he did, took me right in immediately. And so now I'm a year and a half back into CrossFit. Okay. So I've been in it, but I also left it and then came back. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was like a pretty, it sounds like formational thing for you. And, you know, community wise and just identity after call or going into college and, um, probably what is that why it was a good place to go back? Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, that community piece is so big. Um, it's just it, the people in it, I personally, as a coach, and like I went to school as a exercise science major. So I just love fitness in general, and just helping people achieve that fitness aspect. And so being a part of that, um, and the camaraderie, and then even the challenge to, I don't do super well without really being pushed towards something. Um, and CrossFit kind of pulls that out of me. Like I'm always forced to kind of challenge myself in a certain way. And I kind of embrace that aspect. Um, sounds kind of crazy, but I think that's kind of a, the mark of a CrossFitter in a sense. I was going to say that sounds like Um, everybody in CrossFit. (laughs) It's just like, it is fun, right? It's just like, you look back and you're like, wow, the things that we've been able to do or accomplish or even physically, um, it's just like, wow, I never knew what I was physically capable of. Um, and then getting to be a part of that for other people too, and seeing people get their first pull-ups or their bar muscle-ups, or when you're coaching somebody to a PR and a snatch, like I, it, nothing brings me more joy than just being a part of that. And so yeah. definitely I've never, although I quit competing, like I was still always a part of the opens. I was always a part of a CrossFit gym like that. I could never, I don't know if I could ever step away from that. Yeah. Do you see yourself being a part of it like in perpetuity for the rest of your life or is it just still a season right now? Um, the athletic piece I think is for sure a season. I like competing and I, for some reason I'm gifted at it in a way. And so we've been pushing really hard to be as competitive as possible. Um, but I do, I do see myself excited for whatever chapter comes of like integrating it more. I've got a couple of high school kids, um, about six right now that I coach for more sports performance stuff. And so integrating those things, I'm a big golfer, um, okay. integrating CrossFit and golf and how to like, I don't know, help other people do things like that and yeah. just continue to teach. Teaching is something that I'm super passionate about. And so, yeah, I don't know how long it'll last, but I I see myself never exiting the exercise realm. Sure. It also gives me a lot of, it helps me meet people I probably wouldn't normally meet. And I also really enjoy that too. Yeah. Yeah. That's a cool aspect. And that's definitely unique, I think, to the CrossFit culture like the ability to just meet 
like it almost is this really even playing field. Obviously there's tiers of performance and people who are really gifted and people who, are, but this person who's sitting up here at the top is really approachable. Like it's not, this isn't LeBron James, right? Like where you play basketball, you know, on a Monday morning with your, your boys at five, it's never going to cross paths with Michael. Like it's not happening. You know, it's just different stratosphere, but CrossFit like levels the playing field pretty well in that regard. Oh, I'd agree. And I, and I actually take that. Um, I take that as almost a responsibility as an athlete too. Like I, I still do classes here and there with my, the members of my gym. I still have every single year that it's been on. I do Friday night lights with the gym um, just because I don't ever want like me as the athlete to feel like the gym is different for me than it is for somebody else. Right. Um, like I, I think it, it, it blesses me as much as it blesses the person who comes in at four o'clock after work. And so I want them to feel like, you know, you and I are, are the same. We might, like you said, we might perform differently at a class, but at the end of the day, we're both here for the same or similar reasons. Like let's do this right. together. And so, right. well, and that's a good segue, I think into the meat of like this whole do hard things interview series is, you know, you, the people who have the influence in the platform have a do hard things story. And some of them, you know, may embrace more difficult things than others, which is why they've gotten to that level but everybody's got some kind of story and it, you know, it's like right. we talk about leveling the playing field. Everybody can bring something to the table in this conversation. And so it's really fun. Like you never know who you're going to ask and they're like what their story is. And in a way it's a testimony, right? Like that's what we're getting at. <laughs> but, uh, it's just right. you know, veiled in some, some different language, but um, let's, let's get it. So the meat of the whole, the whole reason we're talking is like, what's the hardest thing in your life? that you wouldn't take back? What is that difficult thing? And then subsequently, you know, after you share that, how did you grow because of it? Yeah. I mean, I would have to say the hardest thing that I I went through was definitely that 2018 season. Um, And up until that point, like there is, there's a lot of things that, you know, like I grew up in a broken home or, losing our house when we were 16, like a lot of things or coaches that would say things to me and all this other stuff. But 2018 was the most personal because it was, you know, I went from so high of a mountain, you know, fifth in the world, worldwide in the open, but forfeiting that season to be on a team which I, I, I would never take that back, but to come back the next year, you know, with the excitement and the, the thrill of this idea that, wow, maybe I'm as competitive as Fraser and Belner and all of this stuff. Um, and then to not even get out the first path, yeah. it was like, I mean, it's like getting shot in the heart. Like right. it's, it was so heavy. Um, and I, I had idolized so much of that in my life at the time that it really was just like, man, you don't know who you are at all. Yeah. Which, which is the funny thing. Uh, (laughs) So we used to joke at our old gym, we would always make like a hashtag for the year, something silly. Um, all my friends had moved away 2018. So I was kind of the last one still there. Um, and my hashtag that year was who is Anthony Davis, right? Like people know <laughs> that I did super, they knew, uh, who I was from the year before. Cause I had success in that way. Um, and then 2018 was like in my head, I was like, wow, you know, let's go find out. Yeah. And we found out, um, <laughs> it just, it wasn't quite how I had pictured it. Um, and so yeah, just going from having such high expectations with what felt like so many people looking at you. I mean, so many people who were supporting me um, and coming behind me and lifting me up and doing things to help me be the best version of myself. It was really hard not to 
feel guilty um, for failing. But then also like, yeah, that I just let every single person down. Um, in the end, how I grew from that is obviously, I, and I'm sure you've had plenty of stories on here, right? Like when you get stripped of everything, you know, you are really, really forced to come with the grips of like, who, who are you? What do you believe? And where do you want to go from here? Um, you know, I had a faith going into that scenario, but I realized how low of a view um, I had of faith and grace and mercy. And mm. what I gained from that was like the fullness of that. Um, and I got that from God first because I, I had struggled pretty mentally with a lot of stuff at that time. Um, and to say to not, to not have taken that and indulged in some of the things that I used to indulge in, um, to not run off into Lord knows what I could have ended up being, um, and to really, to challenge myself to step into those things. Um, and at the end of the day, I realized the people still love you. Yeah. (laughs) Like, the people that were on your team before, like they don't, they're not going to leave you because you failed. They're not going to leave you because you came up short. If you're doing it like because you're good at it, right? It's not, it's different if it's like, you know, sometimes you know when you're, you've been a fool, right? Yeah. And some people are like, look, I can't support that. But for me in that circumstance was like, I was chasing something. Um, that people respected and they saw that in me and they, they believe I was capable of it. And even when I failed, they were the first ones to step in and say, like, you're fine. You're okay. And I, it took me time to, to get okay with it. Yeah. Um, but it's like, man, when you have real community, like those people, they love you and you're okay. Like, and it gives you again, that grace to, to go after those things that, you feel have been put on your heart because you know wherever your home is like those people welcome you um right and then now it's just a fresh perspective it's like that my whole entire dream when i started the sport was to go to the games i went to the games in 2017 and it was good but i know it wasn't everything i had pictured it to be sure. um and now it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm chasing that again, but not for, not for any gain of myself. Like if I don't go, I don't go. Um, but if I do go, like God has been really good to me. Yeah. The people he's put in my life have been really good to me mm-hmm. and it would be really fun to get there and like have all of that together yeah. again so dude there's a um you, i don't think you're explicitly saying this but there's this like underlying like shift it sounds like of um it's almost like from entitlement to gratitude like did i put in the work i am who i think i am that's worthy of being in you know whatever level of competition it is right at the games And now it's like, I'm putting in the work, but only if God wants me to be there. Right. And then when you're there, it's like so much more gratitude. And, uh, you know, instead of this, like God, the response that people have to God, right. It's like, God, why, why did you take that from me? Or why did you not let me, you know, I put in all this work. Why? And like, God is the bad guy versus like when it, when it is given to you, it's like, God, like, wow, thank you. Like, how'd I get here? You know, only you. And like, the only thing that changes is your heart, you know, like the work was still there. And, uh, but you just have a whole different perspective. Yeah. It's like I said, even going into 2017, I had, I had a faith story to, so, you know, like for me, I've said I had a couple other things. Like it, it was like a, I was like, prosperity right like yeah I, I 20 <laughs> t- 2016 I said yes 2017 I'm getting recruited 
2017, I'm going to the games. I was like, yeah, God rules. Uh, <laughs> um, and then it was like, you're good. God is good. And he's so good that even in the midst of what felt like the most traumatic moment for me internally was like the greatest blessing he could ever came. It was, it's a switch. It's like when, when they say like the born again mindset was like, yeah, yeah this is, it's not, it's not prosperity, but it's a peace of mind. It's a peace of heart, you know? Yeah. And, and now I can do that with peace. Right. Like I didn't, I wasn't competing with peace before. Cause if I was, I wouldn't have been shattered by a loss. Right. I wouldn't have been so uncomfortable. I wouldn't have been so angry and so frustrated. And now I can, I can step into the field in the arena and be like, look, no matter what happens to me, you know, like I, I my only responsibility is to be the best version of myself right. and represent that kingdom well because it's done so much for me. It's so good. It's been so good to me. And mm -hmm. it's like crazy, like as much chaos and as much, I, I would almost say like anti-Christian, the world seems like it's turning. Um, you know, I've found God to be so much bigger, so much greater and so much more like intimate than I had ever imagined. Yeah. Where it, it, like now I feel like when I read the stories of Paul, where he's just like in anguish for people, you know, cause I'm like, no, this is like, it's not, it's not a trap. It's not a leash. It's not a whatever. It's not this margin that if you, if you do this, everything will be perfect. It's literal freedom. And that's right. what I feel. Um, and that freedom came from my own suffering <laughs> in a way. <laughs> it's just, it's just crazy. Right. It, I don't know. And I, I know some people will hear that and they'll be like, that's silly or that's something that you're supposed to say. Um, but it is for me true, you know, sure. and yeah. like, I don't know that the good, that's the kind of thing where, man, I would have never seen God if it wasn't for that. Right. And it, I mean, yeah, for us humanly, for the small sliver of time here on earth, yeah, it sucks. It really sucks. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm, you know, like I just, I just, it was so good for me. It was so good for me. Mm. Uh, yeah, there's a... Um... So. It's pro I, I've never used this analogy before. It just popped in my head, but it feels a lot like, you know, when you have that peace it's, and the freedom that comes from the difficulty, it's all like this, uh, and maybe it doesn't connect. So feel free to shoot it down. But, uh, you know, you get brand new white tennis shoes and you like, you're way less free than once you get them dirty, you know, and you get them muddy right. and you mess them up and they get a little scuffed up. And you can, then you can go wherever you want. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You know, it's like, yeah. Ah, they don't look as good. They don't look as clean. They're not what I wanted them to be, but you're free. You know, you're not chained into this like idea that you had of the, the fresh kicks. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, that almost sums up 2018. Cause that's how I went into that season was this puffed up, like brand new. Don't mess up. Like yeah. I remember I had one workout, the one prior to the one that really took me out. It wasn't even a bad score. I just went from third in the world to 22nd. And I was so angry. I was like, if I'm not better than I was last year, this is crap. You know, and that's right. so wild, right? To even be in that state. <laughs> um, but that's it, right? It's, it's like, I can't, there's no room for error. There's no room for the mess. There's no room for anything bad. And then they're just like, then it just I literally it was as if somebody shoved me into all mud yeah. <laughs> it was like, it's like all right it's, it's, I'm gonna be. it's all right here I am yeah. this sucks now and then he cleaned me up and mm -hmm. still some mud there you know I'm not perfect I never will be I know that um but 
definitely how I walk now is a lot different. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome, man. I, um, this year, uh, Psalm 23, I've probably read it like, or heard it a thousand times, right. In my life. And, uh, first time I'd ever thought about it, but you know, it says, even though, uh, you lead me on good paths for your namesake. And then immediately after that, the first path that's described is through the valley of the shadow of death. And, uh, like mm. that's a good path, right? Like it's not like these good paths are the water and the green pastures, like all the paths are good. This is also one of them. And, uh, right. I was like pretty encouraged, you know, like, okay, this sucks, but this is still a good path because I have a good shepherd, you know? And, uh, right. yeah, that's good. It just gives different perspective. Um, so, so, okay. You've gone through this season and as an athlete now coach, like you probably have lots of opportunities to speak into people's lives. Right. And, uh, uh, give perspective coming out of the season that you were in 2018. Like what advice do you give people? How do you encourage somebody who's in the middle of their own difficult season? Yeah. And for me, you know, at least the first place that I turned was my faith. So that that's always going to be my first my first saying, because it it was such an impactful thing for me and less than just like, um, just in faith in general, it was just like being actually quiet with yourself. Um, it wasn't until, you know, when things get taken from you that I realized like how busy my mind was trying to avoid feelings or avoid scenarios or avoid this or avoid that. Um, but actually sitting in the stillness and like being real with where you're at and who you are. I think about Galatians at the beginning where Paul talks about his conversion. I want to say it's verse 119, um, but do your own research. So no one calls me a heretic. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, Where he says the first thing, the first thing I did was go into the wilderness. Yeah. Like, my whole life has just changed. I didn't consult anyone or anything first, but I'm not going to be influenced by anyone. I'm just going to be still and listen to what I need to receive. Um, And then from there, finding that community and someone that you can really open up and, and be vulnerable with because like you have to give yourself space for that grace. And I don't think grace can be like fully understood until you're willing to fully surrender all of the things that you're experiencing. Yeah. Um, Like it was, it was really hard for me to, to dig into all of that stuff that I was going through, like, because it wasn't just failing 2018. It was, Oh yeah, that coach that said I was never gonna achieve anything. It was all of those little pieces of people who had talked negatively about me, all those things started to surface. And I had hit him and hid and hid, pushed them under the rugs, put them in different storage units, hoping to never deal with it again. And then it was like, oh, the earthquake happened. Everything just got shook and it's all over the place. And as I'm picking it up. I'm reminded of all of these things that I've been holding on to, but I have to let somebody else see them because yeah. we got to get rid of it. We got to shred it. So here's the paper. Help me shred this thing. Help me shred this thing. Huh. And so, yeah, first just be still, you know, you need time to mourn. You need time to empathize with what's going on. And then when you're ready, find someone that you can be fully open with um, because you need to experience all that too um, so that the grace for it can come fully through. And it wasn't until I started doing that, even in my own life, like as a person who leads faith camps and does stuff like that, right? You hear these crazy, you hear stories of people. And I used to work with high school students some of the stories of the things that they're going through right you just were like blown away you're like wow everything that i was dealing with is very minute 
very mm-hmm. small compared to this. But you also, now that I've let all of my issues out, like I have so much more grace for other people too. Mm-hmm. Cause it's just like, I know what it feels like to be fully seen. And some of you have probably been hiding stuff and you're letting me fully see you. And here it is now. Now I'm giving you the full grace to do that too. Um, and it's a space I don't think we go to very often. Yeah. Um, I mean, hopefully like your spouse, if you're married or someone like that is close, but I've got a couple of mentors in my life that I can call at any time that I want. And they'll listen to every single thing with grace and discernment and walk with me in that. So I encourage people to find that for themselves too, if they're going through something hard. Yeah. So the um so that's grace piece, right? Like you you said something like, oh, I I couldn't experience the fullness of the grace until I like spoke the things that I needed grace for. Like the Bible would say, right? It's coming from darkness into light. Um, speaking right. those things, I think it's in like first John. Um, but talk more about like that idea, right? That all of a sudden, now that you had been vulnerable and, and been able to receive grace for the things that you were holding on to, you you had this like ability to give more grace. It's almost like you know that you I I'm trying to like unpack it verbally and I'm struggling, you can tell. But can you unpack it verbally more? Like that exchange that you're talking about? Yeah, I I think it to me in the simplest way. And I talk way too much out of my brain. So if my tangents get too much, you can tell me too. Um, Like it's the loving your neighbor piece, right? Like how do you love your neighbor as you love yourself? Well, hey, Anthony, who used to be addicted to stuff, Anthony, who was in a pretty close to a, a bad affair. Anthony, who was in all of this stuff, and you start verbalizing all that, it's like, woof, and this person is letting me walk away in complete grace. It's like, yeah, I know what that feels like. Because if I, if, if I can be open about all of that to everyone else, right? Like whatever you tell me now, right? Like I know what it's like to receive the fullness of grace mm-hmm. for that. And so now when I hear people tell me like, like, cause so like my big one and I talk to people the most, like I was super addicted to porn for eight years. I'm now going on four years completely free and almost seven years outside of a two week, like bender, like five or four years ago. Uh, And so that's usually the biggest thing that I talk to the most is now, but I communicated that and I share that and I'm very open with that. Um, and I'll get people who message me and they're like, like, Hey, I'm dealing, I'm struggling with this. And they might be in it at the moment, but I know what it's like to be in that position. And it's like, you're okay. I love you. Let's work through this. Let's talk about some things that we can do to kind of push and pursue getting away from these things or talk about it. Like when was the first time that you experienced this? When it's like, yeah. And you start to have these conversations. And it's like, if I was pretending that I was perfect and that I didn't struggle with that, it's really hard when someone's like, hey, I'm stuck in this place to also be like, oh, you're okay or you're good. Um, and it's almost like what Paul says about like the greater the sin, like how much greater the grace is on the other end of that. I think it's like Romans it's somewhere between three uh, and six, so, but yeah, <laughs> so it's, you know, and that whole little, yeah, yeah, that whole section there is just about like, it's grace upon grace. Like how beautiful is this thing? And the more that you're like, wow, yeah, I do deal with this. I deal with this. I deal with this. It's like your sins might look like they're just stack, 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 stacking up yeah. and sin. Yeah. I know the word makes I know that word makes people uncomfortable with your challenges too, right? Like a few challenges in life, keep building, building, building. Right. And then you receive grace for that, right? Like how great is that grace? And you're like, whoa, wow, that is pretty actually spectacular. That's the beautiful, that's the mystery of Christ. Yeah. And it's, it's we can't comprehend it because we want to, right? Like it's even hard for me to explain it or like how you said, like how do I unpack this, right? Right. 
we can. It's, it's, it's an immeasurable thing. It's a grace that we can't comprehend because it's so great. Right. But it, when you experience that because you come to the end of yourself, it's like, yeah, it's so much easier to give that also back out because you've experienced it. You yeah. know what it's like. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I don't even know if I am. No, man, you totally answered it. Thanks for going a little deeper into it. I think the thing that uh, has always resonated with me in scripture is when Jesus says, hey, if you're thirsty, come to me. And he doesn't say like, I'll give you a drink. He says, I'll turn you into streams of living water. And uh, like, what's cool about that is that then you out of your thirst can be a source of like hydration and quenching someone else's thirst. Like, and that's like a moment of acknowledging, Hey, I need help. Right. I'm thirsty. Help me. And then God takes that and transforms it to be the same for someone else. And, uh, but you can't do that before you come to the point of saying like white flag, I need help. Like it's, uh, when that woman's watching Jesus' feet and right. sitting in the presence of the, the, the church dude, the Pharisee. And, uh, you know, he's like, she's been forgiven much and like, cause she loves much. And she, it wasn't that they were like different in their place before the Lord. It's just, she knew she needed Jesus more and like she could right. receive, you know, and, uh, but transformed because of it. So, right. Yeah, for sure. Dude. So, uh, I got two questions left for you. You got time. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's hit them. So, uh, one is what, um, no, how do I want to phrase this? Have hard things become easier the more you've gone through them? Oh, hard things become easier as I go through them. I would say I, I'm trying to pick a side because <laughs> I usually am. I'm a, I'm a depends guy. It drives my wife nuts sometimes. I'm never, <laughs> uh, it's never yes or no. Restaurant, but it depends on what they serve you. It's never yes or no. She's like, sometimes <laughs> I just need you to, um, I would say yes, only because I also expect them to happen now. Hmm. Um, you, it's like, I don't know. I look around sometimes and I don't like joke, but I'm like, yeah, what do, what do people expect is going to happen, right? Like, yeah. what are we, where are we operating from? What do we, what do we put in our, our mind, our hearts, our soul, and our minds? Like, where are we directing all this stuff? Towards this political agenda on both sides? Sure. Yeah, what do you think people are going to be upset? You got things, we got ourselves scrolling screens for eight hours a day. What do you think? If you got feeds that you're only looking at certain things, like, what do you expect? You know, you know, like, yeah, we're going to struggle because we aren't anchored in. Honestly, sometimes I argue we aren't anchored in any truth. Yeah. Like, where, where do you actually stand on issues outside of like, I don't like that person. That's cool. There's people that I probably should like a little bit more, but I don't. <laughs> right. But it's not because they just think a certain way. Right. Like what, it, what is it about it that we don't like, or what are you for? What do you actually believe? And I've run into that issue at times because it creates controversy um, where I'm just like, we have to articulate and be transparent and speak out what we believe more. Um, not because one, we're going to have differences, all of us, but if we're not really anchored in truth, it, it's more divisive, or at least from our truth, than if we are engaging in differences. Um, and so like when I look around, like just going through the hard things, I just expect life to, to be somewhat hard. Yeah. Um, I, and I have a certain perspective. I don't know if all of your listeners are Christian or not. I don't know. This isn't my home. I know it's not, the world isn't supposed to be perfect. Um, do I have a role in my position here? For sure. Um, to be an ambassador for truth, love, and peace. And I believe that. Um, but if you're not, like, if you're not anchored, we're, like, of course it's going to be hard. Right. And we're all, we're, in a way, a lot of people are searching for it. To, like, I don't know, I talk to people, like, I used to be big into self-help stuff. 
Yeah. And it's like, these are Christian principles. They're just not anchored in Christ. They're just principles. Um, right? Like we cling to yeah. like, if I'm just like gratitude, for instance, is a great one. And we talked about that. And it's probably something that I've really learned and gravitated towards. But forcing gratitude on yourself, does that change anything? Right. Or is it gratitude through something purposeful? That's a question. Some people might find that saying that they're grateful for this, that might bring them life and help. But I don't know if that's going to get you through a challenge. Right. Versus like a gratitude that comes from like, wow, I've experienced that. And I'm really thankful that I got to experience that. Cause that's really what happens and suffering, you know, like some suffering ends in more suffering. Some suffering ends up being like transformative and it mm-hmm. changes you and it changes your perspective. Um, I don't really know if I answered your question, but no, you did, man. You hit on it a few times. Like, it sounds like if I was summarizing your answer, do hard things become easier. The answer is yes, because you just expect them to be coming now. And uh, like having the expectation that this is coming allows you to just mentally kind of rally and be like, all right, here we go. You know, like what else is supposed to be hard? Like, and that's okay. You know? Yeah. And, and that's what, I mean, that's really what inspires others, right? Like no one is i mean i'm trying to think of an example i think you know we both are big into sports right so like what inspired people about michael jordan right because he was the hardest worker on the field nothing came easy to him he spent eight seasons not winning anything but he grinded he took shots from the all these teams he kept going right like he never expected it to be an easy path and that's what sets him apart. And that's why people respect him so much because he grinded at the things that he did, right? Like none of the, I don't, I can't think of any person off the top of my head that we are almost inspired by that didn't grind to get to the place that they were, mm-hmm. right? Like that's something that we respect because it's something that we all go through, right? We all have to right. go through hard things at some point. And so, the tenacity and the willingness to step into it, even though it's hard and knowing that it's going to be hard, I think gives out a different fruit at the end of the harvest. Mm You're like, yeah, that was purposeful. Yeah. Yeah, totally. One of the guys I interviewed, he's the president of the international jump rope union. So the governing body for jump rope. And he, he's like, when I hear, when I think about hard things, I sit up. Cause I'm like, nothing good ever came uh, easy. Like everything that's good, you know, came through something difficult. He's like, it's an opportunity. It's kind of how he looks at it now. Um, I thought that was pretty yeah. like astute. Um, but it's hard. It's hard, almost hard to get to that point, right? You have to live it through a hard thing or two or three uh, before you're like, I, I see why this was valuable. Yeah. And I, sometimes I go back. Um, and I was actually going to write something, I think, even for Faith Rx in the coming weeks. Uh, like James, right? For instance, like we all know that, like take joy in your suffering. Yeah. Now, some people use that out of context, <laughs> right? <laughs> like you don't tell that to someone who just got told they have a terminal disease, right? Sure. That's not the appropriate time to use. It's not a joyful suffering. James is the first book written after like Christ's life, right? And so we're talking about a mass persecution of Christians going on, right? And his book is essentially like a step-by-step, how do I be a Christian in this new world? Right. Because their world at the time was like, yo, we might not make it tomorrow because mm-hmm. they're slaughtering us. That's the suffering he's talking about, right? Like stand firm in your beliefs and know that it's a great joy because you still pursuing christ through suffering is purposeful yeah right it's it's not like yeah we're just 
it's not just like, yo, I'm sick or something. Like that. It's like, nice. it's a pursuit. It's a pursuit that is challenging. Mm-hmm. And if, and you know, right after that, it goes like, look, if any of you need wisdom, ask, and it will be given to you because it's a struggle. Yeah. Right. Like you might not know what to do because it's a, it's a situation that you are having to challenge yourself in. Hmm. Yeah. But that's a great, that's a great joy. Take joy in that because it produces perseverance. It produces endurance. It produces strength. It gives you something like that's when I think about like what you're trying to do through this podcast is that right. Like, why do we do hard things? Because it produces something in us that yeah. we would have never gotten to before. Right. And that's like, that's what that text is really trying to drive out. You know, it's not just like, how do we use this when we feel down? It's like, no, mm-hmm. this is a, this is part of your purpose. This is your drive. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know how it's going to manifest itself, but yeah, just being on this kind of brought that into my brain. Yeah, man. And that's so good. Like this idea, like we could be a person who is um, oriented around what we're pursuing. Like, this is what I'm chasing after. This is what my eyes are set on as a like forward direction. Or we can be a person who's trying to avoid, like, what am I avoiding? How do I like make sure I don't look like this or I don't (laughs) fail here or I don't like, and your eyes are looking backwards or and you don't have this target that you're moving to. Like, there's two ways that you can operate. Are you a pursuer right. or are you an avoider? You know, and that's like what you're talking about. And I love that you tied that James idea. Like, I'm going to chew on that some more because that it's that's good stuff. I hadn't really tied it to that idea. So, all right, man, last question for you. Uh, yeah. What's your, what, what hard thing are you currently working through? Um, so the hardest thing that I'm working through is I I kind of touched on it at the beginning is really embracing still like that I'm stewarding the kingdom through pursuing CrossFit. Hmm. It's still a struggle of mine to, to do something that requires so much energy, effort, um, time commitment, um, how do I eat? Who do I spend my time with? Who do I do those things? A lot of sacrifices are made to try to be at the top of CrossFit. Um, and at times I feel guilty that I'm not able to give more of that outside. Um, but I have to remind myself that for the time given, where can I make the most impact? Um, and right now that just happens to be in CrossFit. Mm -hmm. And so Blocking out those feelings of guilt or those feelings of inconsistency or the, even the feelings of trying to make myself more busy with other things and making sure everyone feels seen, heard, and apart and being like my my role as an athlete can have great benefit to the kingdom, my wife, and our future endeavors with the gym and faith rx and all that stuff and so that's kind of where i'm at right now so i'd say i'm pretty blessed life at the moment thanks for listening to the do hard things podcast by elite srs we hope you're encouraged today and have a newfound hope to persevere be sure to subscribe for more great episodes and conversations and if you ever want to watch an episode check out our youtube channel at youtube.com forward slash elite SRS. Have a blessed day.